Let's pray. Dear Father, we thank you for the example of Jesus, and we know he was kind and loving, and he called us to trust and not to do it on our own because we can't. We pray that you'll help us to be able to practically live that in our lives and have the peace that you want that will also demonstrate to others the peace and, and goodness of the path of Christianity. We pray for those that are struggling with sins, with illnesses. We pray for our world and our country with many important and somewhat scary things happening. And we ask, us that, you, ask that you'll help us trust you. Please be with Pastor Jordan today as he speaks with us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. I want you to imagine with me that you are on a cruise ship. Uh, might be a good thing to imagine with rain outside. You are floating along in the open ocean. You're enjoying a lovely vacation. And in the middle of your trip, a storm hits. And in the midst of all of the chaos that happens, the hull tears and the ship begins to sink. You manage to get on one of the, the lifeboats that are there with two other people. And before you got onto the lifeboat, you grabbed a small bag of provisions, a bottle of water, some crackers, a can of chili. Well, night passes and the, the morning comes and your life blo floats along and, and the bag that you took rests under your seat unopened. No one knows the contents of it. Well, before long, one of you spots land and you're all really excited to finally find land. And as you row toward it, you begin to make out more of the landscape of that island. It's bare and rocky. There's no tree or shrub to be seen. But for right now, it's better than nothing. So you keep rowing towards this coarse patch of land in the middle of the ocean. And as you row towards it, one of the people in the boat turns to you and says, boy, I'm thirsty. And the other one says, wow, I'm hungry. What do you do? Second scenario for you. Same setup, you're vacationing on a ship and it begins to sink and you end up in a lifeboat with two other people in it and you have the same bag of provisions, it's tucked under your seat. And in the morning, one of you spots land. You're all excited and the closer you row towards it, the more you can see of this island. And it is a tropical paradise filled with lush, tall, leafy trees filled with fruit. You can see a waterfall splashing in the distance. It's a small island, but it is lush and abundant. You row excitedly toward the island when one of the people in the boat turns to you and says, boy, I'm thirsty. And the other says, wow, I'm hungry. What do you do? Do you offer a drink of your water? Do you offer to share some of your food? And did your response change between the two scenarios? And even if your answer was the same, I would imagine that you were more willing to share in the second scenario. Why? Were you a nicer person in the second scenario? Were you more moral, more, more Christian in that one? No, none of that changed, but your outlook changed. We're sinful and selfish on either lifeboat, but seeing abundance unlocks something new. We're more willing to be generous. Over the next few weeks, I want to talk with you about the joy of generosity. Not the duty of generosity. Not the obligation of sharing what you have. Not even the righteousness of giving the joy of it. And the way that we can finally make generosity a joy is by learning to see the world the way that Jesus saw it, which is as a place bursting with the generosity of God. 
I'm getting this from a beautiful chunk of teaching in the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 12, if you want to turn there in your own Bible. Luke chapter 12. Jesus is going to talk about worry and anxiety, then he's going to reflect on nature, and then he's going to give a challenge for his audience. And we're going to walk through this together. We start in verse 22. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear. For life is more than food and the body more than clothes. Jesus identifies two key worries, two basic needs, what you will eat, what you will wear. Now he's going to look to nature. Consider the ravens. They do not sow or reap. They have no storeroom or barn, yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable are you than the birds? So argument number one from Jesus, don't worry about what you will eat. God provides for the birds. How much more will he provide for you? Jesus goes on. Who of you can, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? Since you cannot do this very little thing, why do you worry about the rest? Consider how the wildflowers grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and gone tomorrow, thrown into the fire, how much more will he clothe you, you of little faith. So argument number two, don't worry about what you will wear. God beautifully clothes the flowers of the field that bloom and die regularly. How much more will he provide for you? So before we keep reading what Jesus says, just think about this worldview for a moment. Jesus looks around at the patterns of nature and he sees God's generous fingerprint. And this way of seeing the world is something that Jesus is getting from Scripture. Psalm 104 is one of the best examples of this. This is a song of praise. And just listen to these verses. We'll read a chunk of this in the middle. The Lord makes springs pour water into the ravines. It flows between the mountains. They give water to all the beasts of the field. The wild donkeys quench their thirsts. The birds of the sky nest by the waters. They sing among the branches. He waters the mountains from his upper chambers. The land is satisfied by the fruit of his work. He makes grass grow for the cattle and plants for people to cultivate, bringing forth food from the earth. Wine that gladdens human hearts, oil to make their faces shine, and bread that sustains their hearts. The trees of the Lord are well watered. The cedars of Lebanon that he planted, there the birds make their nests. The stork has its home in the junipers. And then we'll skip down a bit to verse 27. All creatures look to you to give them their food at the proper time. When you give it to them, they gather it up. When you open your hand, they are satisfied with good things. This is exactly what Jesus is teaching in Luke chapter 12. The way that food and water and shelter are provided in creation are a witness to God's open hand. And this is not just some primitive, pre-science way of viewing nature. No, the psalmist lived in an agrarian society. He's very familiar with the cycles of nature, probably more familiar than we are with these things. Yet he believes that nature bears witness to a reality about the heart of God. And Jesus agrees with this. Jesus' way of addressing our worries and anxieties in life is by reigniting this worldview. He says this world is not a barren rock. It's an abundant garden tended by a loving father. And so, let's continue with what Jesus says. Do not set your heart on what you will eat or drink. Do not worry about it. For the pagan world runs after such things, and your father already knows that you need them. But seek his kingdom, and all these things will be given to you as well. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Now, Jesus could stop right there with this message of encouragement and reassurance, right? Trust in God, seek his kingdom, and God will provide for you. That's that's a really comforting message. But Jesus takes things a step further. Because God's world teems with abundance, sell your possessions and give to the poor. 
Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out, a treasure in heaven that will never fail, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Whoa, okay, that took things a step further, didn't it? We'll talk more about this part in in weeks to come, but for now, all that I want you to catch is Jesus' logic here. God is generous, so you can be generous too. Jesus believes that generosity is the heartbeat of the universe, and God's children are invited to partner with their creator and experience the joy of giving. In fact, this theme actually goes beyond just the ways that God sustains creation. The gospel is often presented as a story of divine generosity. Here's just a a few examples of this, most famously, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that what? He gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Or this in Romans chapter 8. He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for all of us. How will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? And perhaps the best verse that draws on this language is 2 Corinthians 8. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. This is all over your Bible. The gospel is a story of giving. And conversely, sin is a story of taking. Instead of receiving what God has graciously given, humans desire and grasp at the wrong things. So, let's rewind all the way to the beginning of your Bible and see how all of these themes interact in Eden. What does God create for humanity at the beginning? Where do they they live? In a garden, right. Now, we have gardens all around. We've got a garden right out back. You probably, not probably, how many of you have a garden at home? Okay, I figured it was a lot of you. Yeah, many of you have gardens at home. Um, But in the ancient Near East, guardians, gardens were a, a luxury for the privileged. This is a desert land that they live in, and you need resources and irrigation and innovation to be able to sustain a garden. These are luxuries. This is why one of the seven wonders of the ancient world is the hanging, hanging gardens of Babylon, right? Gardens were not commonplace, and yet this is where God creates a home for humans. He gives them this land of luxury. And if that's not surprising enough, Many ancient cultures had their own versions of creation stories, and most of those stories also involved a garden. But in these stories, the garden is where the gods lived. In one famous Babylonian creation story, the Atrahasis Epic, the the gods decide that it takes a lot of labor to maintain the garden that they live in, so they assign keeping the garden to their divine children as chores. But eventually, these god kids... They grow up, they hit puberty, and they don't want to do it anymore. So the gods get together and they decide that they're going to create humans to work the garden for them. That's how humans enter the story. Now contrast that with what we read about creation in the Bible. God labors to make a garden for humans, not the other way around. This God doesn't make others work for him. He works for them. Rachel and I are in the midst of of getting a nursery ready for our baby on the way. Um, We've been painting and shopping for decor and deciding how we want the the space to look. And the anticipation of that nursery is wonderful. Uh, Many of you know what I'm talking about here. We're not just designing a room in our house. We are creating a space for our little girl to call home. And you could read Genesis 1 and 2, in a similar light, God is creating a space for his children to call home, and he makes it a place of beauty, of curiosity, of vibrant colors and wonderful smells. All week long, he's prepping for day six when this garden place can become a garden home. And notice what God says to humanity. 
God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it, they will be yours for food. There's that language of generosity. Again, Eden is this place of abundance. So how does this all sour? What goes wrong here? Well, it's the lies and the implications of a serpent. Eve approaches the one tree whose fruit they are not supposed to eat, and she begins a conversation with this serpent. The serpent asks, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? So notice how the serpent tries to invert the garden. It's not a place of generosity. It's a place of restriction. You can't eat from any of the trees. Now, Eve, at first, recognizes that this is not true, and she tells them that there's only one tree whose fruit will cause them to die. But then the serpent counters with this, you will not certainly die, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Again, the implication is that God is withholding something from you. The serpent reframes the story. God is not giving abundantly. He's holding back. The central lie that, spend, that sends our world spiraling is that God can't be trusted. God isn't actually generous. And so what happens here? Well, we read that she took the fruit and ate it. Creation is about God giving. Sin is about humans taking. And what's the first thing that they notice after eating the fruit? They realize that they are naked. They realize that they lack something. And this feeling of lack has haunted us throughout history. We don't often live with Jesus' worldview of abundance. We live with a worldview of scarcity instead, what psychologists call a scarcity mindset. This is where you focus on areas of your life where you feel like you just don't have enough. You feel like you lack something. The author Lynn Twist puts it this way in her book, The Soul of Money. This quote is kind of long, but it's super good. For me and for many of us, our first waking thought of the day is, I didn't get enough sleep. The next one is, I don't have enough time. Anyone? Whether true or not, that thought of not enough occurs to us automatically before we even think to question or examine it. We spend most of the hours and the days of our lives hearing, explaining, complaining, or worrying about what we don't have enough of. Before we even sit up in bed, before our feet touch the floor, we're already inadequate, already behind, already losing, already lacking something. And by the time we go to bed at night, our minds are racing with a litany of what we didn't get or didn't get done that day. We go to sleep burdened by these thoughts and wake up to that reverie of lack. This internal condition of scarcity, this mindset of scarcity, lives at the very heart of our jealousies, our greed, our prejudice, and our arguments with life. That is so insightful. I know exactly what she's talking about. In my most stressed out and strained moments, I know that reverie of lack that she's describing there. And this goes all the way back to Eden. The root of the serpent's lie is that you don't have enough. You need more. And so we grasp for more. And yet no matter how much we gain in life, we never, ever have enough. Solomon actually reflected on this in the book of Ecclesiastes. There we go. Whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. We, fi- we try to find the good life by gaining, by gaining more and more, but the things that we chase just leave us empty. We never feel that we have enough. And so followers of Jesus are challenged to abandon this anxiety for more. And the first step in doing this is to just have fresh eyes for the generosity of God in the world. If you look out at the world and you see a place of scarcity, then you will always strain for more and you will never be content in life. But if you train your heart to see the abundance of God in the birds, and the trees, and in the blessings of your life, this will free you. Free you not just to be content 
in life, but free you also to be generous as well. That's the point that Jesus ultimately arrives at, isn't it? Sell your possessions, give to the poor. Why do we do these things? It's because we aren't anchored in the temporary things of this world. We praise the greatest giver in the universe and our gratefulness to him gives way to generosity in our own lives. So when we begin talking about being generous, the conversation does not begin with practices on tithing or stewardship. No, it begins with the character of God and the abundance that overflows from his heart. And once we see life this way, we desire to partner with God in this joy of giving. Listen to what Paul writes in 1 Timothy 6. This whole chapter is great. We'll return to it in a later week. But notice how Paul connects all of the dots here. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but instead to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. So there's the abundance piece right there. God is rich towards us, therefore, Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. God's generosity is what inspires our own. This is what Jesus wants to grow in our hearts. So it's not about just waiting until you have more resources than you know what to do with, and then you can be generous with that excess. No, this is also about being on the lifeboat with meager provisions and still being willing to share even of that. Why? Because God's children don't live in a land of scarcity, we live in a world of abundance. And when we reflect God's giving heart to other people, then we discover a joy that money and items and luxury experiences promise, but can never fully deliver. So we'll say more about all of that piece in later weeks, but I don't wanna get there quite yet. For right now, all I want to do is invite you into Jesus's worldview. Where do you struggle to feel like you have enough? Are there areas of your life where you just wish that you had more of something? And I know that you know the right answer is to say, no, I'm perfectly content with everything in my life. But honestly, think about what takes up your worrying, your spending, you're dreaming. Are there ways that you are living from a scarcity mindset? Listen to this verse from Hebrews. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Now we can find all sorts of verses in the Bible along this line. The love of money is foolish, it's fruitless. Being content is the way to have peace in life. And I think that we would all agree with the sentiment behind this verse. That's a little easier said than done though, isn't it? It's easier to be content with what you have when you have everything that you feel you need. It's easy to accept this verse once you've hit a certain standard of living. But there are many who live without even the basic necessities in life. Does this verse still apply to them? Yes. And here's the reason why this applies to everyone. The verse goes on. Be content with what you have, because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. Friends, true contentment comes not from a certain standard of living. It comes from acknowledging that we already have all that we need. We have a loving Heavenly Father who provides for us. Or, in the words of a very famous psalm, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Other translations say, I lack nothing. God, the greatest giver, the generous provider, his eye is on the sparrow and the flowers, so I know he watches me. So when you wake up in the morning, after not enough sleep, when you go about your day uh, working hard and feeling unappreciated, when you crawl into bed at night out of sheer exhaustion, take a moment and breathe in 
the generosity of God. Now, you can do this the way that Jesus did it, um, by looking at the ways that God provides in nature. You can think about the birds and the flowers and the trees. Or you can reflect on the story of Scripture and think about the ways that God gave of himself in order to offer salvation to the world. Or you can bring to mind all of the blessings of your own life. You don't have to swim in scarcity. Turns out generosity is the true melody of the universe and Jesus invites you to hear its tune. And before long, you're gonna wanna sing that melody in your own life. Now, if that challenge is a little too abstract for you, I've got a more practical challenge for you. Um, I did this recently when we were going through the book of Job. I'm going to do it again. So Psalm 104 is a chapter that we read part of earlier about all of the ways that God provides for creation. I want to challenge you to read this chapter through once a day throughout this week. That's all you have to do. Read this chapter. This is a song of wonder and praise. And if you're fighting to feel like you have enough in life, I challenge you to just meditate on these words and let this worldview soak into your life. So, as you can tell, we're going to close by singing a song. Uh, It's an old hymn whose uh, words I already kind of referenced subtly there a moment ago um, that draws beautifully on everything that Jesus was teaching. We're going to sing the song, His Eye is on the Sparrow. Um, And I invite you all to stand as we sing.
Father God, we began our service by praying that your goodness would manifest in our lives. And I just pray right now as we leave that you would give us eyes to see your goodness all around. That when we look at nature, when we look at um, the ways that you have led and guided in our lives, um, when we look at the relationships that we have, I pray that all of it would just be a reflection of your generosity towards us. Give us that joy throughout this week. We pray this in your name. Amen. We hope you can stay for a potluck today and for our concert that'll happen right after that. Thank you for being here.